discuss clinical applications of VR, for instance, in trauma therapy, phantom pain rehabilitation, exposure therapy, or even as virtual prosthetics to assist people who lost some of their abilities. I haven't done an extensive literature review on the topic, as my work is artistic rather than clinical, and I think this uh, presentation will make that very obvious. So my PhD was held at the Norwegian Film School and my supervisors were game designer and author Christy Dina and production designer C. Langdalen. Um, and although I'm the only person presenting this research, it has involved a very long list of artists, designers, producers and advisors. And on top of that, more than 200 participants have contributed to growing the stories behind the work. And so when I tell you about my outcomes in a minute, bear in mind that it took many brains and many hands, not only to build them, but to give them life. To keep some flow in this talk, I have centralized most of the media credits at the end of this presentation. So please take a moment to read them. So the outcomes of my research were a VR LARP, prototype called Lone Wolf Stick Together, developed in 2023 with the company Bridge VR, an online exposition available on Research Catalog, which is an online platform to create interactive, more specialized forms of documentation for artistic research. So that's something I can give you the link to. And a physical multimedia installation as public presentation, which was held in Oslo last November. My research stems from a very simple fascination, which is that we can, in fact, create digital worlds. And with VR, we can feel part of them. We can decide on their atmosphere composition, their laws of physics, their limitations, their opportunities, the beings and things that populate them. And VR can displace us inside these worlds at the scale of our own body, with similar affordances to those of our own body. We can move, crouch, turn around, pick up a flower, open a door and glimpse at what's on the other side. For a moment, we can accept these worlds, perhaps even accept that we belong to this strange virtual reality. Immersiver and immersiver. This is the title of the very first entry I wrote when I started my research log back in 2017. After eating the mushrooms that turned her into a giantess, Alice exclaims to herself, curiouser and curiouser, full of excitement for a minute before she started crying to the point of flooding Wonderland. And here I was, spread between excitement and concern, contemplating the immersive potentials of working with VR narratives. I've always had a soft spot for immersion, in particular through designing and playing LARPs. In fact, I deemed LARP to be the most immersive form of fiction there could be. I don't know if this is the audience to convince, but in case there are some people less familiar with LARP, LARP allows us to have stories that aren't locked within within that aren't locked within a medium, stories that can be lived. Lived from within, as players make the fictional characters their own. Lived through doing, as players have full agency to move, act, and engage in activities. Lived through social interaction, as players need to be addressed as their characters to believe in this new ecosystem. All in all, Stories lived through being there. Since Hassel, we commonly refer to the evident reality that we perceive and experience together as life world. As such, LARP or any fictional reality that we experience together can be referred to as a story world. And so I thought that bringing VR and its digital worlds together with LARP would push forward the possibility of creating such story worlds, going towards some sort of complete artifact of reality making. Early on, to explain what I was working on, I would show this diagram. What I wanted to explore would need all these circles to meet. First, we would need to be playing a character experiencing their own inner world. This character would need to interact with other players also playing characters. 
these interactions would belong to a wider story, and that story would be set as a synthetic environment that the players could interact with. In other words, I could use LARP knowledge in narrative design and human interaction, and video game knowledge in environmental design and digital interaction. But there was something more that I wanted to explore. And for that, I always come back to using the word immersion, specifically because it is vague and expressive. In fact, I resonate with the way we talk about immersion in film as some quality inherited from being a long, from its long history of being a big spectacle with live or surround sound, immersion as transportation, as something connected to the ability to capture us into a story, immersion as absorption, but also because of a more diffuse quality, that of creating empathy, introspection, sentimentality, a quality that music perhaps expresses the most naturally, immersion as emotion. More than cracking the codes of engagement, I wanted to try and brush the ungraspable emotionality of Im immersion. And that is why my main work during this research is based on a film, what VR makers call a flat film. Зона — это очень сложная система ловушек, что ли. Но стоит тут появиться людям, как все здесь приходит в движение. Здесь исполнится ваше самое заветное желание. Самое выстраданное. Stalker directed by Andrei Tarkovsky in 1979, stages a journey in a strange, dreamlike reality, and it is the main inspiration of my work with Lone Wolf Stick Together. In many ways, Tarkovsky himself, when he discusses cinema, the art of sculpting in time, talks about this bizarre, immersive emotion. When he writes, the virtue of cinema is that it appropriates time complete with that material reality to which it is eternally bound and which surrounds us. He also echoes to something that is a lot harder to define than categories of engagement, something related to the poetics of presence and to magic. In Stoker, the characters venture a mysterious zone in hopes of finding a secret magical place. This magical groom, room grants whomever visits it the fulfillment of their most intimate desire. The zone and stalker already feel like a virtual world, one in which time and the laws of matter have been shifted for the characters and the spectator alike. Sounds, spaces, transitions, all paint a poetic, impossible reality. In fact, every time I see stalker, the journey seems to be different. It is what philosopher Foucault would call a heterotopia, somewhere capable of juxtaposing in a single real place several spaces, several sites that are in themselves incompatible. In Stoker, heterotopia and the very idea of journey become one, for there is no map of the zone and no shortcut. If anything, the characters progress because they reach the appropriate state of mind to find their way again. 
navigating, it seems, through psychogeography. The zone is indissociable from the journey towards the room, and it is indissociable from the characters that visit it. Other than its monumental artistic legacy, Stoker and Coyle's something I find essential, both in design and in research, the journey. The real title of my research has changed countless times along the years, and the very last one is this one, Lone Wolf Stick Together, Research as a Journey to an Aesthetic Understanding of Immersion and Participation Through VR and Role-Playing, and I'll unpack what it means. So I have approached this artistic research as a con constructivist project. Constructivism values knowledge within a realization and a context, rather than through seeking an absolute truth. And artistic research, on the other side, values the learnings that come from experimenting with artistic practice and from experiencing the work. For those who might be less familiar with artistic research, I like this simple quote from art historian Konrad Fiedler, who states already in the 19th century that the work of art does not contain an idea, but is itself an idea. So to understand this idea, we have to feel into it instead of only analyzing it. In other terms, I have been exploring the theme of my work through iterating on it, but also, also through feeling into it going from a hermeneutic understanding to an aesthetic understanding. As such, I'm choosing to present you my research as a journey through the iterations and discussions around Lone Wolf Stick Together. Along the way, I collaborated on four main iterations of this work, and between all those prototypes, I have organized the LARP 18 times. And so we go back to 2017, when I embarked on this research journey. At that time, there was little know-how and little examples in the field of VR interactive narratives. As for me, I also had little access to technology and budget. And so I therefore started, as we regularly do in all fields of design, with some physical prototyping. Game designer Sean Patton coined the word brown boxing to describe physical prototypes of VR experiences. It comes from gray boxing, which refers to using gray blocks as placeholders for final assets in game engines. Similarly, brown, boxes, brown boxing uses cardboard and physical elements as placeholders for VR assets. So combining brown boxing with LARP therefore allowed me to get the first functional iteration of Lone Wolves without engaging much costs. In this rather stripped down context, I was constrained to focus on writing. So I wrote the characters, their backstories, their dilemmas, and I wrote the narrative events that would bring rhythm to the experience. And so in Lone Wolves Stick Together, six characters go on a journey in mysterious woods. They are spread into two mirroring groups with different drives, hope and regrets. Their journey follows five narrative acts, doubts, nostalgia, disillusion, despair, and truth. After going through all of these, the characters reach their destination, the chamber. The LARP then ends with the, their individual decision to enter it or not. In this first physical iteration of the LARP, I tested also a narrative device that was conceived for the VR experience. VR can be uncomfortable or painful to some, and to most of us, it is more tiring and challenging than the regular role play, even more so for new role players. And so I wanted to create some breathers, if not from VR, from its most intense, intense parts, the role play. So between, of, between each of the five role playing acts, I would send the participants on a walk out of the playing area with obstructed swimming goggles and a discman each. That way, they would experience having to walk carefully, listening to inner monologues and inner soundscapes. In the experience, these breaks are called walking into the woods. They allow the participants to return to a contemplative slow pace and get in the proper mindset with the support of their individual narrated stream of thoughts. After their walk, they return to the role playing to role playing the next act. 
Sound artist and research lead Trondlosius told me one day that shifting, be shifting between the recurring motive of the woods and the thematic acts was reminiscent of the musical form Ritornello, and so I have been using this term ever since. For all of these iterations, from the earliest physical ground boxing to the latest VR experience and to the final exhibition, the narrative structure remained the same. It is a journey of five acts for six characters that seek a miracle. In Lone Wolf Stick Together, and maybe in Stalker too, the characters are stuck in what Dante calls the middle of life, a moment where life seems locked in pain, in a meaningless redundancy, when we cannot overcome its many grievances. In his reading of Dante, literary critic Bart suggests that the way to shake that state is to find la vita nuova, the new life, to embark on the journey and to change. Role play can be tied to personal therapy, as I am sure you know if you're following this series, but also to ritual and to social design. Suddenly, we accept a social contract that turns strangers into our siblings, children, rivals. Suddenly, through our character, we're also invited to see the world differently, or at least to interact with people that do. In the Divine Comedy, just like in Lone Wolves, the characters do not walk alone. They need the companionship, the witnessing, the guidance of others to find their way. The characters of Lone Wolf stick together are complete strangers who are built on conflicting archetypes. Those guided by hopes and those guided by regrets. Those following a spiritual path. Those only answering to logic and institution. Those seeking meaning in creation. Those strangers think and feel radically differently. Yet suddenly they are confronting their opinions and sharing the desire to find a miracle. Augusto Boal, who works with theatre as a tool for pedagogy and transformation, says that theatre is a rehearsal for the revolution. And in this work too, there is a desire to test a revolutionary reality. We talk a lot about the polarization of the world, the divine opposition between good and evil, the right side of history, the wrong side of religion, the drift between young men getting more conservative and young women getting more progressive. But what would happen if strangers with conflicting worldviews, all of them stuck in their lives, were to go on a difficult journey together, far from their echo chambers? I believe social diversity exposure, sometimes the exposure to what we despise, fear or combat, is necessary not only to think fairly about the world beyond ourselves, but also to feel less lonely. Through walking with strangers and embodying a stranger, perhaps can we learn about ourselves and about our endless craving to belong. If man to man is wolf from our safe lives, let us dive in. And so the experience starts on the following premise. You are a wolf. A wolf that cannot live the life of the herd. Homesick, homeless, awaken. Your restlessness is calling for a miracle. Whether you're suffering from the writer's block and it is driving you mad. Whether you want to save a loved one from a terminal disease. Whether you want the world to be less of a mess. It seems to you that your very last resort is to seek the chamber the one place where all most intimate desires come true. Today you are going to the woods and you cannot go there alone. But after this strenuous journey in your conflicted desires, once you've made it to the threshold of the chamber, will you be afraid of what your heart truly wishes for? Will you still want to cheat fate? Will you still want to escape? This narration was brought to life first in London 
with the participation of a generous and talented group of LARPers and designers, thanks to the Reactor Core, if you're listening. At that point, all the props, sounds and sets could fit into a suitcase. For me, this was a prototype for a VR experience. However, this first version of Lone Wolf Stick Together was indissociable from a classic chamber LARP, which is how we often call short form single location LARP. And so I started reflecting on the potential reciprocities between physical and digital participatory experiences. If physical LARPs can be the model for virtual LARPs, perhaps can we also consider the opposite? Digital experiences could be translated quite literally into physical ones. This de-digitalization pursuit could be actually an option for digital practitioners, game developers, VR makers, um, interaction designers to disseminate their ideas with a different format, perhaps sometimes in a more sustainable and more economically accessible way. From the first iteration of Lone Wolves, we jump straight into the most spectacular one, although it's still not VR. It was a large scale collaboration with the 12 sound design and production design students of the Norwegian Film School in 2018. Together, we conceived a 360 massive immersive environment with atmospheric soundscapes and audiovisual shifts reacting to players' decisions and narrative events. I will show you a short video of the environments we created. The soundtrack you will hear is the personal narration of the character guide, the first one they listened to while walking into the woods. Sounds and voice by Lynn Teresa Coulerud. Guide. Everything is possible. The woods taught you that. The grass. The rain. At times, the snow. Yet, as always, this dreadful thought gets to you. What if they weren't worthy of the woods? Look at them. Have you made a mistake? It is impossible to know what people are, what they think, what they mean, what they will do here, to the woods or to themselves. And the more they doubt, the more you doubt. For it is an act of faith to venture the woods and an act of destruction to deny their truth.
This opportunity to collaborate with the bachelor students was also a way for me and their teachers to experiment with horizontal co-creation, which was a very controversial attempt at reshuffling the hierarchy in our traditional film school. Generally led by the creative pair, director and cinematographer, the production design or, uh, scenography, or scenography students and sound design students employ themselves to understanding someone else's vision for this collaboration, we wanted them to set the tone for a large scale, expensive collective project. We therefore worked with weaving scenography, surround sound and narrative design without giving precedence to any of these fields. When contemplating transformation in the arts and in our practices, we might have a duty to observe our own work methods and whether they help or hinder the fulfillment of our team members too when we ask for help, when we have other artists, photographers, reviewers involved, are we giving them space to explore their own practice? Are we giving them a way to find ownership? Or are we pushing only for the realization of our grand plan? Other than aiming for individual creativity development, another consequence of this collaboration was that the environments ended up being particularly rich and according to participants' feedback, conducive to role play. Our collaboration process is documented on an article that is published for the ICA conference 2019, if you're curious. The situation was of course very special in scale and its eerie aesthetics have followed the project until the very last VR prototype. In fact, the character soundtracks remain the same in VR. And so I organized that LARP, the same one that was fitting into my suitcase in these 500 square meters of immersive and interactive sets. This organization allowed me to discover, if not merge with QLab, a queuing software regularly used for triggering live sounds and lights. It is through using QLab again and again that I could formulate clearly what sort of VR tool and functionalities I would need to facilitate that LARP in VR. And so at this point, the LARP did last between five and eight hours, including pre-play workshops. And uh, eight hours is a format that most people who are not LARPers do not feel comfortable engaging with. And I do not blame them. It does take some boldness to jump blindly into a somewhat gloomy experience that requires you to talk about existential questions for an entire day. But I couldn't let that format dissuade a vaster audience to discover these sets. This amount of craftsmanship and artistry, and also the human and material resources employed were just so big that I needed another way to invite participants to join in. And so, in order to make Lone Wolves accessible, I worked on three different tiers of experience. As designer and scholar Christy Dina writes, she's also my main supervisor, tiers provide separate content to different audiences and in doing so facilitate a different experience of a work of a world. Video games often propose several modes of play, multiplayer, solo, campaign, etc. But we still rarely consider tiering in physical experiences, in film and in the arts or even tiering for accessibility and sustainability reasons. The tiers I worked on were called dive, swim and float. There are three different narrative experiences with different levels of participation. Dive, dive was the longest. It is the one with the most game and narrative mechanics, the full on LARP. The second tier, swim, allowed participants to get progressively involved into the story or to remain entirely passive. Roleplay was still present, but opt-in and opt-out, and paid actors were stirring the journey. Finally, the third tier, Float, took the form of a guided tour of the environment with solitary moments of exploration and comments on the sets. This tier I reorganized last year in form of my final presentation in Oslo. 
I ended up organizing 13 versions of Lone Wolf Stick Together over the course of a month, welcoming over 100 participants, most of them not used to role play. My motivation to work on tiers of experience was to open the work to a wider audience than seasoned LARPers or art experimentalists. But by writing these three different experiences, I also discovered that tiering had the potentials of creating more sustainable, durable, and diverse story worlds. Both film production and video game development tend to have very wasteful practices based on building sets and assets from scratch again and again. But environments can be reused. And by thinking more in terms of story worlds and environmental design, we can reroute our creativity. Instead of starting from scratch, we can create for the settings and assets we have access to. Not only one experience, but a variety of experiences that will be meaningful to a variety of people. I actually think that tiering is also very relevant to transformative experiences too. It is impossible to measure impact in art and it is also probably not desirable. Film, books, a nicely written Reddit post might be more transformative to some than, than some intricate LARP specifically designed to trigger transformation. Some of us will accept the diegesis more when it is painted around the third person than when we have to be part of it. And so there is something in tiering that can allow us to experiment also with different degrees of distance to the fiction, the action, or the character. That way we can perhaps let participants place the encounter with the story world at the right place for themselves at their preferred distance to take the themes, actions, and ideas that might be useful to them. That distance is likely to move back and forth. And as an example, the feedback I got from people playing swim, so the intermediary theme, was that it made them want to play dive, the full LARP. In the spirit of wanting to reuse sets and assets, I wanted to scan and conserve these spectacular physical environments. Ideally, I would have been able to use them as the digital settings for my VR LARP. So I tried bridging to the virtual with attempts at photogrammetry, which is a method of recording objects using multiple photographies, and with attempts at LIDAR scanning, which is laser scanning. The files, although uncanny and haunting in their own way, were too big to process and use in a digital prototype, at least then and with my uh, level of technical literacy. But I do think that this is a good solution um, with the right equipment and the right people, and it's going to be easier and easier. From these runs, I have kept forms and forms of feedback but also content that was written by the participants while in character. In particular, I have a hundred of farewell letters written during the preplay workshops and a full booklet of scenes transcriptions. These letters and quotes appear in my final exhibition, as well as in the research catalog exposition, as an attempt to pile up the stories that have been jointly told and constitute the story world. One year later, I was finally approaching VR development with XR experimentalist Macropol and technical artist Rike Janssen. Our multiplayer technology was not functional, so we tested mixing role playing physically with solo explorative VR sequences as some sort of on site hybrid LARP form. This experience threw me in the cold waters of developing softwares for the Oculus Quest, which is mobile technology. And this was also the Quest 1, so particularly tricky mobile technology. Working with mobile is very different from working with PC or console game development. The pipeline requires to simplify and stylize artistic direction, and also to work around tedious lighting processes and optimi optimization. Everything takes four hours to change. With such difficulties to create the technical setup needed to experiment VR LARP, this iteration became for me a thought exercise about designing with teleabsence. 
So the term teleabsence categorizes the lack of bodily flow of information that prevents us from fully understanding and enjoying one another online, all the biological clues and our instinctive way of relating to one another. There is an immeasurable difference between relating to physical bodies and digital bodies. For most of us, that difference impacts our ability to experience closeness and to role play. And so I started dissecting, dissecting what seemed absolutely necessary to transpose from physical role play know how to digital role play. For that, I worked on pre play workshops that would help participants transitioning from playing with a body to playing just with a voice to playing behind a mask mask to then playing with the body language of a VR avatar. Since then, my understanding of digital closeness has shifted a lot. In particular, I like thinking about VR native ways to be close. How can we expand beyond adapting real life and real bodies affordances? After all, there are other intimacies to explore. For instance, the vulnerability of experiencing individual binaural sounds. Or we can be literally transported into another avatar under their skin and inside their point of view. Altogether, we can think of growing an entirely different digital physical vocabulary involving more than human bodies, limbs, prosthetics, tentacles, pixels, etc. Many of these questions I have only scratched in my research journey, but will be crucial to the future of the form and to exploring transformation. Although I left with no functional prototype to show at this time, this iteration allowed me to consolidate the series of pre-play workshops I would need to run Lone Wolves as a VR LARP. These exercises ranged from common theater and LARP character development to VR specific embodiment and meditation. They were held in a level or an environment called the bar, which remained the same in the final VR prototype. Finally, in 2023, I worked on a full VR prototype with the company Bridge VR, which is based in Trondheim and is made of VR pioneers and role-play enthusiasts. And this prototype is the main final outcome of my PhD. The environment, the design of this final prototype interlaces my collaboration with Bridge with the influence of all the artists and participants that have joined previous iterations. I will also show you a video of it. They are all doubting again. Why don't they believe? Why can't they believe? May everything that was planned still come true. Pray for them. Pray so they can learn to breathe in the woods. Pray for their pain to flourish and show them the way. You. You believe. You believe. You believe. You believe. You Weakness is the greatest of powers, for it leads you to the woods. Do you have to show it to the world? To step inside, get your brother cured, 
and use it as evidence? No. You believe. But if you can't make them believe, do you still need to believe? Scout? I'm a trainee under guide supervision, or so I was. Guide is dead. <laughs> we found the body behind the bar. I'm calling because your name was in the suicide letter. It says, tell Scout not to enter the chamber. It doesn't work. Whatever horrors you did to your family, it won't fix it. I tried to save my brother, it didn't work. All it brought me was money, tons of it. Do you really think you can live with who you really are? Because that's what the chamber will bring you. The nasty things you truly want, not what you want to become, or what you think you want to change. That's it for me. Finally, I could take participants to experience the journey entirely digitally from their remote homes. The inner monologues could seamlessly enter their headsets and make the woods all the more uncanny. I further realized that working with VR narratives brings this extra aura to our work. Not only do participants discover a story world, they often also discover the potentials of virtual reality. Very apparently so, VR becomes what psychologist Winnicott calls reality testing. In this state of curiosity, where a lot of us want to test the possibilities of interaction, what opens, what has gravity, what can be done or said, we return to an almost infant-like sort of play. And in this state, perhaps, we can further experiment with shifting our own adult reality. As always with games and new technology, only a fraction of what's intended could come to fruition. For instance, we dreamed of having the participants record a farewell message before leaving for the journey. Those messages would then later reappear in the set despair, triggered by interacting with the scriptures on the walls. We also talked of having characters appearing and disappearing, changes of avatars, of scales, full dream sequences, we wanted an inventory system for characters' objects, altogether more gameplay and interaction. But although none of this was possible within our scope, the narrative structure and the core of the experience, the role play, the interaction between participants, was still intact. For this, I also have to mention um, the facilitating tool that we developed which allowed me to teleport players into the right environments, trigger sounds, ambience, and narrative events like the phone call you heard or flashbacks. Of course, we also wanted to support the roleplay with expressive avatars. Ideally, there would have been some customization, some facial expressions, and long floating quotes with their own physics. But the avatars in the prototype ended up being minimal silhouettes, only differing from one another through the color of the mask. Surprisingly, though, when debriefing the VR experience, several participants mentioned finding each other curiously expressive. They talked about voices, but more unexpectedly so, to me at least, they talked about the eyes, eyes that are in fact a mere blinking animation, and the exact same one for all. What do I look like under the mask? 
Working with VR the past few years, I had forgotten about our generous ability to perceive or invent emotions where we feel they should be. And so this form of technological anthropomorphism allowed me to appreciate our somewhat minimal prototype all the more. In fact, I appreciate how imperfect VR can be, just like I enjoyed older video games with low polygon figures, the grain of film, or even role playing on games and platforms that are not designed for role playing. Firstly, because we get used to the crankiness as our comfort levels do adapt and our own Im imagination joins the game. And secondly, because this might be just a few precious years before all we see are hyper convincing virtual realities. In these dissonant worlds, as philosopher Adorno would call them, we see aspects of the material truth behind the harmony. In my article Comments on VR and LARP, published in the last Stolmukota book, I discuss the expectations of realism and high definition that come with VR and why we might want to challenge them and to challenge our quest for inconspicuous technology altogether. Writer Legacy Russell goes as far as talking about the politics of glitch. She writes, the glitch is the catalyst, not the error. The glitch is the happy accident. When the computer freezes mid-conversation, when the video buffers and refuses to progress, these moments are a new mode of foreplay, something that needs to be acknowledged. All the people I have taken in VR have encountered technical issues. But in this profound annoyance and lassitude, there was a time spent thinking about technology, perhaps a precious glitch. When I finally presented publicly this research, I wanted to reuse the principles from the simple, simpler tier of experience called float. Although not the most interactive or virtual tier, float allowed me to open this work to 100 visitors, including children and people with very little initial interest in games. In this exposition, I integrated research texts, player quotes, and game narration to physical sets. Videos mixing digital and physical settings were projected in each of the narrative installations, both as documentation and atmospheric content. Once more, I could retrieve participants' content in notebooks. And once more, thoughts were fusing about the chamber and decisions were made. Constructivist artistic research like this one could last forever. Every session and every iteration and reaching the story world and leading to more secrets to hide in the next one. And so there might be more coming after this. In my research catalog contribution, you can read more about the whole journey and themes. You can find all my design documents, as well as the three peer reviewed articles I wrote during this research. My documentation also mentions the other adjacent VR projects I worked on along the years. The Space Between Us, a two player role playing adventure from 2019, set in two different planets after the ecological collapse of the Earth. Ancient Hours, in collaboration with Josephine Rudberg, and Dates in Real Life, a series partly shot in VR produced by Maipo Films for the Norwegian National Television. After this research, I plan to keep on exploring, designing for reality testing, testing the reality of our own selves by trying on different hats of selfhood, as Sarah Lynn Bowman writes, including our are young and shadow, the parts we do not wish to see. But I also want to test how our understanding of the world and society changes as we shift bodies and position. As the famous comic says, in virtual worlds after all, the codes we carry are easier to blur. I'm interested in exploring different interpretations of cognition beyond what we assume is normal perception or human perception by combining VR and interface design. And I want to keep on testing the way we relate to one another through characters that find a sense of belonging, not only within comfortable echo chambers, but with the other. Finally, I want to keep on testing the way we relate to technology, 
to discomfort, to awe, testing the worlds we can be part of, perhaps through conjugating social design with simulation, testing, perhaps, as musician Alexi Perala puts, the alliance of computing power and human connection. I sadly can't uh, name all the people that are featuring here, so I'm just showing you some faces really quick. Um, and I assume I will be able to link my references somewhere else after this. I think I'm probably finishing early because I spoke very fast, but thank you for your attention and that's it for me. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, wow, what a journey you've taken us on. <laughs> Um, I really admire the way that you are able to be so connected with your work and, and the way that you transport us through your delivery of your work, not just the actual art piece, but also the way that you have framed this. It, it feels like I've been in a trance for the last hour. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of happy cheers and love in the chat um, and some questions and I have several questions as well um, so we'll go for the next 35 minutes if that's okay with you yeah that's great so uh, somebody asks uh, can you tell us what the interactions are between the players you also mentioned the environment responding to player decisions um, and now I, I'm assuming this this came in when you were talking more about the physical space rather than the VR space. So I think this uh, ties to that, but it might be a good question for all of these spaces, like to what degree uh, did, could participants interact and how? And um, he also asks, what would be an example of a player decision in, lo in Lone Wolves in the dive tier? Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, so in the physical sets, the 360 big sets that we built in cinema setting, everything was intractable, of course, and um, the players were encouraged to to do as much as they could. There were, um, it's hard to explain it with, and I wish I had shown you now, but uh, they had uh, also balls to throw to the other groups. It's, there are a lot of things that I didn't um, get into details in the construction of the LARPs, but it's two groups that play in two different halves of the space in two different temporality and that play back and forth. And so the players' actions and discussions in one temporality affect the players in the other temporality. Um, and then there was some reactivity between the sets and the players. So, for instance, um, if players started interacting with a musical instrument, then we would trigger a soundtrack. Um, if players started having a specific discussion, then we would uh, trigger a flashback. Um, Mm, yeah, uh, mm, the main player's decisions happen in the last act, as we often do in LARP. We keep all the drama for the end, so nobody's uh, blocked in their play. Um, and so um, they, are, they are mainly very existential decisions, as in, do you enter the chamber or not? Do you interact with um, the gun in a way or another? Um, do you try to destroy the chamber. There are um, different characters with different views on uh, on the chamber and on their own life and that have these questions to resolve in order to make a decision at the end. Um, yeah, I think I'm answering a bit in all directions. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, you should play the LARP to find out, I guess. Well, we would love to tell us how we yeah. can <laughs> yeah we I mean, run again yeah in vr definitely so if you have access to vr headsets you can uh, poke me and i'll try to organize some more sessions it's six players per session so as long as we have six people willing to be online at the same time that's doable and physically why not um that would be fun to put together again so we'll see great 
Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like the participants are engaging in a lot of like um, sort of metaphysical or like existential conversation. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's the, um, if you've seen the film Stalker, I think that's uh, part of the, the core of that film is the quality of the discussions between these people that are very archetypical in ways that do not match. So they are constantly debating and criticizing each other. And there is something of that that is in, in this LARP as well. Um, with an agenda, of course, of going through a journey together, making you see things from each other's perspective and learning about each other's lives, making you understand and accept one another. That sounds like something I would love to play. <laughs> so, great. Uh, another person says, thank you for the uncanny magic and deep understanding shared. I would love to hear you talk even more about how the materiality had an impact on the different iterations of the LARP and which outcome the players experienced. So I'm wondering if you answered that just now in terms of how they can interact with the um, environment. Um, and But there's also a question here about iterations, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, the thing is, um, sadly, we couldn't experiment so much about uh, interacting with the virtual environment. There were only a few things that were interactable um, you could move around. So it's, I would say the impact of the materiality in the VR development ended up a lot about trying to uh, reconstruct some atmospheres and some senses of space. So of claustrophobia or openness of darkness, brightness, nostalgia. So trying to use this knowledge that you get from the embodied experience to try to redevelop it in VR. I don't know if that's also aligned with the question. I think so, it sounds like it. Um, we have a question. I very much like how you are moving from visions of VR as a copy of physical art to start to embrace the specific limitations and opportunities. Uh, still, you you yourself started from designing physical environments for physical ARPs and then moved to VR. Could you elaborate a bit on how you would start now when you also start from VR as the medium? Hmm. So I have several angles to <laughs> pick from to answer this question. One is the practical angle, and maybe that's not the most exciting one, but uh, I think it's something I have to say to you if you want to start developing VR LARPs now, uh, do not develop, do not try to develop environments. Uh, it's extremely limiting. Use pre-existing platforms like social VR, um, VR chat being a very good example of it because they have an excellent avatar system and it's uh, fueled with uh, Unity. So you can, well, end their own um, programming language, but it's not very difficult. So if you have someone that has basic understanding of game engines, you can set up an environment in Unity and upload it to VRChat, which will take care of the multiplayer question and the servers and the avatar system. It has, of course, you know, its limitations as well, but that would definitely allow you to start working with what VR has to offer faster. Um, then the other answer would be to try to collaborate truly with a game developer, programmer, artist, technical artist maybe, and try to um, to play with um, virtual bodies and glitches and the weirdness you can find with just working with game engines. Um, that's something that I think is uh, really interesting to play with. Is, there are so many things that are impossible, that are hard to do. So you have to find creative solutions for it. And it's in these creative solutions, I think that you understand your medium better. Um, so, so yes, I, if I was to start over again um, and I was on my own, I would work with pre-existing user-generated environments in something like VR chats. Uh, and if I had some budget, I would try to find a collaborator to really get deep into the gain and engine limitations and options and try to see what it means to be a blob and yeah, how it feels. 
That makes a lot of sense because, I mean, we're LARP designers. We're not programmers oftentimes. I mean, the person who asked the question is an exception, but uh, a lot of us don't. It, it would take a whole other skill set of trying to adopt in order to do even the most basic kinds of interaction that we have out here. So it makes sense to use pre-existing tools, especially nowadays, because like you said, the customization is like really a, a big profound shift from how it was with MMORPGs, as I understand it. So, Yeah, absolutely. So it really depends on what is the core of what you want to explore. If it's the interaction, the human interaction, the story, the digital interaction, then yes, go for it. If you want to explore the materiality of VR, then yes, it makes more sense to try to collaborate with a technical artist and a programmer and explore shaders and the weirdness in there. So it's for LARP, pure LARP, I would say, yeah, social VR, maybe art can take you somewhere else. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, dear Nadja, thank you for your talk and rich insights from your research. I have a question around the sound design in your LARP. Can you say something about the process of designing for immersion through sounds and music? Yeah, so um, actually, I think that's one of the most powerful tools we have with immersive arts and VR. Um, the ability to layer different sort of sounds um, and sound design. So you can work with surround sound to create a 360 environment. Um, in Unity, you can definitely uh, you have like you have add-ons that allow you to recreate surround sounds, but you can also localize different sources. So you could have every asset have its own sound file, for instance. And on top of that, you can use binaural sounds, so sounds that is directly um, in both ears of your uh, participants to create something more intimate um, and individual. And I really think that um, the more you pile up these different ways of working with sound, the more immersive your experience becomes. I'm curious as any limitations that might have in terms of neurodiversity or people with different needs, um, what do you think? Yes, um, and uh, that uh, kicks in very fast because it takes more time, of course, to uh, make sure that the sound does not permeate, permeate from one environment to the next or that you can have, if you have several groups having several discussions at the same time, it's also, um, it takes some more design work to think about, uh, to make sure that you implement, you can do all of it. There are solutions to all of it. So you can definitely make sure that the discussions are uh, contained into the small space and the small um, perimeter around the group. So the other group further away does not hear it. But I would say VR is quite susceptible to what we call the cocktail effect when several uh, sound sources pile up and then can be quite difficult to uh, focus if you are neurodivergent in particular, or it's also altogether very difficult to focus. So, but if you have access to a game angel, a game engine, then you can find solutions to all of that. My prototype has some issues still uh, with this, so I'm very aware of it. Um, but yes, with more time, it would have been fixed. That's really good to hear. And I'm imagining it might also be possible to have like varying degrees of opting in with regard to sound. Like maybe there's a more simplified version for people who, um, you know, really get overstimulated with a lot of overlays of sound. Um, I'm, I'm, because it's like, just like you have the different forms of immersion in terms of the physical enactment, maybe, you know, that kind of participation as well. Yeah, absolutely. You could definitely think of several audiovisual uh, experiences as well um, with less uh, stimulation. Okay. So I'm super curious about how you got all of these people to collaborate with each other. I mean, you've got filmmakers, you've got technical artists, you've got LARPers. Um, how, how did you onboard them into this process and get them sort of involved in this shared vision? Um, hmm. I think by uh, asking them what they wanted to explore themselves was the 
the way to get in because um, every artist has something they're interested in, curious about. And often so there is an area of overlap. So of course, I also have struggled to find people that were interested in that. So it's not, um, it's not just any um, person with a skill that joined in. It's people that were at least a bit receptive, except for students who didn't have a choice. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but they, had, uh, they had their own artistic curiosity and a lot of freedom. So, um, so I think they all got something out of this. Um, yeah, I think um, there it's a negotiation between collaboration and individual vision, and that I often favored the collaboration toward rather than the individual vision. As a consequence, maybe some things have lasted longer. Maybe I didn't manage to have a prototype early on. Um, maybe what I would have truly wanted deep in my heart uh, did not uh, come to life. But I'm very happy with the what we managed to make together um so so yeah i think it would be a longer discussion with more uh back and forth question to answer fully this question but uh freedom and uh letting people go towards what they're curious about probably i think that's beautiful and it really sounds like the LARP process to me um actually and i'm wondering if you know, that influenced your, um, inspired your, your, the way you were thinking about this project, because for those who might not uh, be familiar with LARP out in the audience, uh, it's really a co-creative experience. I mean, the designers can set things up, but what the LARPers end up doing with it is often their own, their own show to a certain degree. So I'm wondering if that differs from your perspective from other contemporary artists. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, that's right. I, I don't know if I am uh, attracted to LARP also for this reason. So it's something, I mean, I've been LARPing since I was 14. So LARP also raised me into being, I think, a better collaborator for sure. Um, so, so maybe, maybe. Um, and definitely, I would say it's not the canonical way of working in the arts and definitely not in film. Um, and there is uh, this idea that horizontality is an effective and utopian and um, that um, you need to be behind one decision maker and to, to, to get things to a certain level. Um, I mostly disagree. I think in some cases it can be true that you can push things more eff efficiently into a higher summit if you do that, but I also think it's not worth it. Um, yeah, I think the fulfillment of everyone in the team is more important than this shiny final project. Mm -hmm. And I know we have some, you know, digital game designers or people who've been studying digital game design in the audience, and that also resonates with the way that I've been seeing that process. You know, we have a lot of game design students that get to work very collaboratively and take turns taking different roles in the groups. But then when they go to industry, especially in larger companies, they're sort of expected to fit into a very specific role and maybe there isn't a lot of creative input. So um, I think that, you know, being able to keep that spirit of collaboration and co-creation mm -hmm. alive when in the industry is a tension. Um, I absolutely, completely agree. It's uh, it's really tricky, and it's also tricky if you do research on LARP or on the collaborative form because you're the person getting maybe a research budget, maybe getting some um, academic credits for collaborative work as well. So there are uh, lots of questions around uh, those tensions with working with collaboration and also wanting to juggle different hats and um, and fitting in institutions and industry uh, in different ways. So in the industry, in the ways you've described in academia with the fact that you can only be one person submitting a PhD, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, it sounds like they probably got a great experience out of it, even though you're the auteur, so to speak. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I'm really interested in the way you framed the work. You mentioned briefly the workshops, but you didn't go into a lot of detail. I'm also wondering if you had some debriefing as part of the process. 
Um, yeah, so it's uh, quite uh, the final VR LARP does last between two and three hours with some breaks um, after workshops and debriefing. Um, and it's pretty classic chamber LARP um, format. So we have uh, the difference is that I think that when you work with VR LARP, you need to have everything take. You need to take really your time when you give instructions and you need to repeat yourself a lot and you need to accommodate for a time of playful chaos first because people will get into the space and they will want to discover how you move around what you can interact with so they will need this paedia chaotic play time where they just explore everything and i think it's counterproductive to try to just get everybody to focus immediately so you need to let people play around uh, a kind of a tutorial phase of how do you interact with controllers etc even if you think people know how to use vr um, every system is different every app is different so they often will need a reset time so yeah um, and then more progressively getting into role playing and into character development group development um, then I had some more specific workshops for the specific narrative techniques of the LARP, um, which I can explain, but it's also, um, I don't know if it's uh, a bit uh, difficult to understand without any illustrations, but the, the back and forth between the two groups had their own workshop and then how to flashback, which is also a classic one. and. And then you start the experience and um, and so you have these five role playing acts that are in five different environments and in between each of those this moment of walking in the woods listening to your individual song track and at the end a debriefing. Yeah. Mm. So it sounds like it's fairly ritualized then in a way um, where you're having this transition between these these different states. Yes, it's a. Uh, it's quite guided and ritualized. Um, I have no doubt though that more uh, free uh, forms of LARP with, uh, that are more based on entirely on the emergence of play can also work very well in VR, but that's not so much what I work with. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about this in the end with regard to the large scale experiences I'm interested in what the participant makeup was like of the people who came and like dove all the way in. Like, were they all mostly LARPers or were there some curious non-LARPers? So you mean when I organized the, in the physical sets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so mostly not LARPers. I had quite, not that many LARPers that took the trip to Lillehammer, a few of them and some from different countries. So thank you for still coming and see this big set. But mostly, uh, so weirdly I had some local people from Lillehammer, which is a 25,000 inhabitants uh, city in the middle of Norway um, that were just curious because something weird was happening in their city. I had some uh, students um, uh, of the university that uh, either of the film school or of other places uh, had very few colleagues that dared uh, trying to LARP, but, but yeah, I had, um, it was a lot of um, someone mentioning it to someone else, word of mouth, word of mouth, is that how you say it um, in English, maybe? So, so yeah, um, curious, random people, I would say was the main uh, composition, uh, but we, yeah, it was, it was not that easy to find uh, players to come and play. But I, I sort of love that, like your colleagues are like, oh no, I couldn't do that. And then these yeah. like random people from town are like, I'll try yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. But, but I think it's harder for your colleagues to, I think it's easier when you're a complete stranger and you have no, um, no social interactions afterwards to maintain. Or no identity to maintain while you're there and in this exactly. space. And, yeah. Anonymity, which is another strong suit of VR. Mm -hmm.
Um, what do you think is the future of these technologies with regard to their integration with role-playing games? Big question, but. Um, so what is the future of VR role-playing? Yeah, somewhat, um, VR, AR, XR. Um, so that's that's a good question. I have speculated on the idea that it might be possible that we have an immersive mass media at some point. So that's something that's been represented in science fiction, but the idea that we could um, inhabit some big fictional franchise and role play within it. Um, I think that's the trend that is going on with video games. We have these big franchises in, within which we can do everything. So the main, the most played games in the world are all these sort of gigantic game worlds. Um, Minecraft, PUBG, um, Fortnite, you can role play, have a lot of mini games within them. Um, you're all close to have your entire OS within the uh, game world. So I would not be surprised if we would have some sort of immersive mass media that um, that comes out and that maybe has some roots in some LARP know-how for the better or the worse. Uh, at least I think it's something interesting to think about. I, I can't predict that this is what is going to happen. I don't know, but I think it's an interesting thing to reflect on and to anticipate. Um, other than that, there is um, there are quite a few uh, VR apps that mimic tabletop role play, and there are quite a few AR augmented reality projects that also allow you to have the more um, game mechanics heavy sides of role playing, uh, like uh, representing superpowers, um, dice rolls, representing you know destruction of the map, etc. The whole map that exists on tablet or on things that you know holographic like devices. So, so that's, I think that's, will keep on progressing and uh, yeah, LARP is still niche now as a fully functional technology, the real life LARP. So, so I, I don't know about VR LARP. Very interesting. I would love to hear more about these different technologies that are coming out. I mean, I know about technologies that allow you to do tabletop games online, but you know, this idea that you could actually cast a spell and, you know, something happens. That's really interesting to me. Uh, somebody is saying the main advantage of VR is the accessibility and distribution. It can make an experience that is distributed around the world and experience around the world. Physical LARP is hard and expensive to run and can only access a relatively small audience. Would you agree with that? Partly, I think it depends on how you, um think of LARP and of accessibility and expenses because there is a cost to um, to hardware and to maintaining servers online and to perhaps eventually work with um, generated environments as it looks to be the trend that we have AI inviting itself in all creative industries. So um, if you think in terms of the carbon print of a VR LARP versus a physical LARP, uh, it also depends on which physical LARP we're talking about. So there are a lot of local, um, smaller um, budget LARPs that exist. Um, but but I would agree that for the most uh, impressive experiences, then VR LARP is more accessible. And that also it's more accessible to people with um, um, some um, mobility uh, issues uh, or um, are also with some sort of um, neurodivergence that make maybe physical so socialization more challenging. So there are, it caters maybe to different people in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, think, a, it's an interesting question and a complex one, I think. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm just thinking about the labor involved in actually bringing a bunch of costumes and props to a site and trying to make it look immersive and, you know, all the hours mm -hmm. that go into, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you still want to onboard players, but like there seems to be some things that might be taken care of in a way uh, by using the online environments that um, might make it easier for, for, for new de uh, designers and new um, facilitators. Absolutely. Yeah. 
That's true. And you can uh, have uh, very different appearances to those that you would be able to um, reach in real life, which is a double-edged sword as well in questions of, you know, you can actually look like whatever you want to look like. And behave however you want to behave, which exactly. of course has been a problem on, online for since its advent, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any participant reactions that you're able to share, like anonymized or anything like that? Um, to the VR LARP specifically, or um, a any of it? No. Yeah. I mean, I I've had I've organized it so many times that I feel like I've had the whole spectrum of really of uh, reactions from this was the most transformative thing ever from a non-LARPer, of course, discovering LARP as well, you know, to um, um, I didn't like it or I don't know. So I, it's, um, I don't know if I've had reactions that I wouldn't have had with another project with this one. Uh, so nothing, nothing that comes to my mind that is worth mentioning, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, yeah. It was again to me. I I assume that you might relate to this bringing VR, uh, bring LARP to non-LARP spaces always creates uh, a shift in uh, in the people and the spaces. Uh, as in, um, it's still very unknown and still um, very immediately um, engrossing somehow. So so this is something that I experienced many, many times along the years, seeing people coming from arts, from film, from theater, from games, uh, realizing that you can have this uh, crazy radical form of play uh, that is accessible and that people engage in. And you don't need a bunch of planning and you don't need anybody to dictate what that experience is for you. It can happen like in the moment, which I think is truly remarkable, like watching people who don't even identify as gamers be able to just unlock their creativity and just jump into it. Even like older people, we've, we've been running a lot of like applied role-playing games for, you know, people who are studying, you know, how to handle conflict more effectively, for example. And, you know, mm -hmm. people in their sixties just diving into LARP, it's really uh, wonderful to see. And it happens so quick. Like once people give themselves permission. But... Exactly, exactly. That's uh, definitely my experience too. Um, you mentioned uh, that you started LARPing when you were 14. What was your first LARP experience and what was your journey like? Um, so it was a medieval fantastic uh, fantasy LARP uh, in the French countryside in Alsace. Um, and I went there with my father, so I'm a second generation LARPer. Um, in the universe of Aukmoon, and I was immediately completely smitten, and I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. I mean, we had, it's, LARP has changed a lot this uh, few decades since I started playing, definitely. Um, and this is a LARP that costed me 30, 35 euros for a weekend LARP into a fort with, um, you know, an, uh, troglodyte cathedral and uh, arenas and uh, there was an amazing player involvement and I think that's something that is hard to find nowadays like the amount of individual efforts that was put by players to create their camp their little alcove shops their uh, specialization um, was really beyond anything I've experienced in the last decade probably um, so yeah seeing that people were so committed to go as far as they could in this cre collective creation of a story world is uh, definitely what got me so curious and interested in it yeah wow that's amazing um, yeah. <laughs> and what it kind of reminds me and I'm wondering if it has to do with the uh, 
if it was a campaign, so maybe there's more investment with keeping the same characters or keeping the same site. And so I was thinking of Burning Man and how people will prepare all year to create their Burning Man setups that kind of reminded me of that, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to these one shot LARPs that we often go to nowadays where, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to put that level of investment probably in for one weekend. Well, that's the thing. I think it's it's tied to this commodification of LARP more. I don't think it was a campaign, but I think people did not do as many LARPs per year, probably as big format LARPs per year. And they did not. And there's we've also had this shift of culture, I think, where now um, there is a whole marketing campaign around a LARP. And so you have this very professionalized team of LARP makers um, that seem to be capturing this product for you and so it's i think this attitude also contributes to making players feel like they can just show up and the whole magic and the whole universe has been defined already uh, also because of the way we present our larps with so much effort in this visual representations and this discourse and this you know advertisement of it yeah. and i'm just thinking about what you're saying in terms of people not playing um, multiple larps I think there's a technological component here too, where a lot of people just simply didn't know about other LARPs that were happening in their area. So, or they there was a hostility even between LARP groups um, around like, oh, I, I don't do that. I don't do science fiction or whatever it is, you know, like I don't do that kind of play. I do this kind of play. Um, yeah. Whereas now we have people so interconnected online and they're seeing about, all, you know, that's the positive thing of the promotion, right? They're seeing different kinds of games that they could potentially be playing. Definitely. And, and also, I wonder if there is not uh, just m now more generations of older LARPers with more means so that can afford also to play more expensive LARPs and that want more comfortable experiences um, and uh, that can afford to play a lot, um, while uh, maybe that was less the case 20 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're at time. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your work with us and for hypnotizing us and <laughs> drawing us into your, to your, not just your, but it sounds like a very creative experience, um, uh, co-creative experience with, with all of your collaborators. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation and the discussion and everyone who attended and asked questions. Um, our next event, I believe, will be uh, Yelfa Rydberg, who you were talking about earlier, your collaborator. That will yeah. be in August. I will share details about that uh, later, um, but I'm very excited to hear kind of the other side of the work that you're, you've been doing uh, uh, from her perspective. She's also a volunteer here with EDGE. Um, so we are the Transformative Play Initiative. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, we have a YouTube channel and I'm told that you should like and subscribe. <laughs> Speaking of promotion, I don't always like to do that, but you know, it does help to get the word out there. And also just, we have over a hundred videos um, that might be of interest to you um, and YouTube, Facebook, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but for now, we will say goodbye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you for coming.